I'll let me let me just quickly introduce everybody. So um, first, I'm I'm Javier Ruiz. I'm a partner at JKI, and I'll be um, moderating this uh, panel slash debate. Um, uh, so uh, I want to ask um, everybody to kind of quickly introduce themselves. So maybe I'll start with how I see people on my screen. So Olivier, would you want would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, of course. Uh, so my name is Olivier Jourdan. I've been working with Labiou for 20 years now. And uh, I have two uh, open source projects. Uh, I started working on one year ago. Uh, one is about uh, uh, generating um, ASCII doc files with Labview, and the other one is generating uh, documentation from your Labview codes. So cool. I've this... seen that one. It's very cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, Jim, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Jim. I've been using Labview for, I guess, about uh, 25 years now. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, so uh, let's see. We started doing open source back in 2002 at NI Week. We had kind of a get together and pulled a bunch of folks together that wanted to work on some OpenG uh, libraries together. And I was really just interested in sharing some of my code and uh, learning from other people, having them help work on some things that I wanted to build. Uh, yeah, and then we uh, we started working on. Uh, VXM for sharing that code and getting it installed into LabVIEW. Um, so I think, yeah, we started working on VIPM probably about like 18 years ago, 15, 18 years ago. Um, yeah, and so at JKI and then over the years, we've developed a bunch of tools and have decided, you know, most of those, many of them are worth essentially just sharing uh, the source code because there's nothing super secret uh, and having other people develop them with us. Uh, I should probably stop talking, though. But yeah, so uh, <laughs> lot of, I've worked on a lot of open source projects over the years. Awesome. Uh, do you want to go next, Chris? Yeah, sure. Hey, uh, my name is Chris Cellino. It's great to see everybody. Um, so a little bit about me, LabVIEW champion. Um, I've got about, say, 8 to 10, 12, uh, 8 to 10 open source projects right now in my Bitbucket. Uh, I have a real passion for open source stuff. Um, I've got uh, an automated build process, an automated documentation utility. Uh, and just like what Jim just said, there's nothing that's super proprietary in any of these things, and it makes our lives a lot easier. And I have a philosophy that if we inside the community of our lives can get easier by using each other's work, then we can do really cool stuff together. And that's where the magic happens. And that's what led me to uh, build, uh, to, to found and the president of G Central. Uh, my hope is to get all of this open source goodness uh, in everybody's reach. So allowing everybody to find and use each other's code, to collaborate on the code, and then to easily give it back. So I have a real passion for open source and sharing. Cool. Awesome. Jorg, do you want to go next? And I'm sorry about the pronunciation of some names, but I'm familiar with this. I, I, me, so <laughs> yeah, I, feel, I, I know how you so. feel. <laughs> um, well, I've, I've uh, gotten used to it, I guess. Um, it's not that big of a deal, so it's Jörg. Um, but uh, I made a joke of it at the G, G uh, not to mix up all the events, uh, to <laughs> put the IPA notation of the name there, and nobody could read that either. So any anyhow. So <laughs> Jörg or Jörg is also OK. Cool. So I'm an Austrian living in Germany. Um, I've been creating software for a living for 20 years. And I'm running my own small company. We're doing lovely consulting and our tagline is that we work with our customers to increase the quality of their software to improve development processes. And I think this is marketing speak for, uh, we work together with our customers and we try to make them more proficient because it makes all of our lives easier. And this is really where my interest lies. So I like working with people and figuring out how to make that easier. And uh, this is why we are big believers in inner source. And uh, inner source is a, it's a term coined by Tim O'Reilly. It means taking open source tools and processes and applying them to your corporate world. And um, in order to be able to do that, um, we found it interesting to share something of our code and see how that works and um, how we can, if and how we can make that fly and what are the processes, what are the tools for that. 
And um, like you guys also said, there's so many things that are not really proprietary and there's not even rocket science, but somebody needs to put in the work. And we share something of that and that's working nice for us. So I like it. Cool, thanks for that. Um, and how did you say how long have you been doing LabVIEW? Um, 13 years, 13, okay. yeah, it's 2007. Cool. I'm and Levy champion reason, and CLA and the whole yada yada that everybody here is, I guess. So <laughs> well, the only reason I ask is because I'm gonna go kind of chronologically to ask the next the next question. So since Jim, you seems like you've been doing Labio for a little bit a few years longer than everybody else. So can you can we and this is gonna be a question for her, can we can we briefly describe like your understanding of the history of the open source movement for Labio? Like Always like that? Was LabVIEW always meant to be used open source? Like, was OpenGL always there? Well, so I think people had been sharing code and and providing it for download on their websites. I remember uh, like there were different toolboxes that like people had put up. Um, and a big question that everybody had was, how do we do open source in LabVIEW? And I remember it was a huge. <laughs> It was a huge philosophical debate about like you know where where would we even put a little text based license copy paste because LabVIEW is code graphical there is no text code. <laughs> so where, do we, where do we put a, a a license and you know because LabVIEW uh, you know is is a commercial proprietary development environment and you really the community need needed to purchase LabVIEW in order to even open these files. What does that mean to have open source code in a proprietary visual programming environment where you can't even open the files and read them? Um, but we we basically just took a gamble and said, well, let's just slap copy paste some license agreements, and we we picked some good agreements. Uh, eventually, we kind of settled on the BFD license as being, at least initially for most of us, the most commercial friendly open source uh, license because it lets people kind of do whatever they want with it. Um, and it just really, you know, took off. A lot of people were, were interested in participating and in, in sharing their code. Cool. So it, it sounds like, so it wasn't that easy. It wasn't like everyone, it, it wasn't like Labby 9 from the get-go to be open source, and basically the community kind of had to figure it out. Yeah, the community figured it out, and I guess, you know, maybe just kind of skipping kind of ahead, you know, with uh, the LabVIEW Community Edition that was released, uh, announced uh, last kind of, uh, you know, fall yeah. time frame. Uh, I think now anybody in the community can basically open up this code, and it's created a lot more kind of interest and uh, in in accessibility, which is really cool and exciting. For right. Um, Olivier, your thoughts on on the history and and any any anything that you've experienced? Yeah, uh, probably uh, it's interesting because in my experience, I, I'm kind of a newbie on on the open source project because. Uh, I just started uh, on open source projects uh, when I started my own company. Uh, when I left the, the company uh, I was working for uh, before, uh, I decided to uh, to try uh, to create a, a, an open source project. It was one of my new challenge, and uh, the thing uh, that's really uh, uh, um, helped me to to create this first project was to change uh, from SVN to Git. It was the first yeah. thing I need to do to be able to, to work, to have my own project or to collaborate on, on another uh, open source project. And that's probably the, the first thing uh, that needs to be done uh, in order to, to work on, a, on an open source project. And uh, the, the, the presentation uh, of Jörg and James uh, just before this session was really interesting because it, it was showing you how you can uh, work uh, and collaborate with an open source project. So. Cool. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And, and I think same for me, I, I'm, I'm late to the game of open sourcing stuff. Um, so I, I appreciate your comments. Chris, Chris, do you wanna give us your, your thoughts? And I'm also interested in, interested in your answer, Chris, because you used to work for NI. So uh, I would also like to hear kind of the insider view of 
was open source a, a, a thread? Was open source always a plan? So I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, sure. You. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll start off with my time at NI. Uh, so I spent 12 years at NI. Um, the first three years was in applications engineering, and that's where I got my first exposure to open source initiatives like OpenG and you know VI mm. Package Manager. And we were all really excited about it. That was pretty cool. Uh, I think that. Um, oh, so then I moved into uh, R and D where I owned the DAC assistant, and I helped out with Sound Vibration Measurement Suite for about seven years. Uh, yeah, grand total of seven years. Um, and it's not. I, I don't think that we actually used open so source code inside NI. So from my own little small segment of NI, I didn't really get my hands on open source code and we felt like we had to you know, kind of do everything from scratch. Then uh, I moved over to um, Cirrus Logic where I became the uh, application uh, uh, architect out there, the, the validation framework architect. And uh, we fell in love with things that were exposed through VI Package Manager, NI Package Manager, G Package Manager. Um, and then I got a little bit frustrated because it's like, well, where do I find all of this stuff so that I can use it, which led me to start you know, G Central. But now to Olivier's point, uh, I think that finding the code is the first step. Then you have to be able to collaborate on the code and that's where Git uh, and source code control kind of come into play. So I'm really excited to see where things are moving uh, kind of going forward from here. Cool, well, thanks for that. Um, Jorg, do you want to give us your your impressions? And, and also, it's also interesting interesting because you you are in a different part of the world so maybe that also changes how you saw uh the history of open source and things developing well i think that my perspective is not so valuable because for the first few years i did a lot of um, project work in the trenches and fighting the the fights that you fight with customer projects mm -hmm. and i was working a lot of uh, on my own so i i didn't have a lot of I didn't look a lot into the community as a whole. Um, that only changed when I actually did the CLA and visited the first CLA summit. Mm. And that changed my whole world. Um, mm. Because up to that part, I was thinking that I'm the big concho and I'm the levy expert and I know the ins and outs. <laughs> and then uh, when I went to the CLA summit, not only did I realize that I know nothing or <laughs> very little, not nothing, but very little. I did have a lot of experience fixing stuff. So that, that was helpful. Um, I think I'm good at debugging, but of all the things that you could do with LabVIEW, I didn't have an idea. And also all the people were so nice. And this was really when I started to look in the community. And this changed many things at the same time because uh, we, I had been working with, a, with a, an associate and we were having our own framework, uh, closed source, um, selling licenses, which was good for our customers because they did get the value. So that was okay, but for me, I, I didn't want that. I wanted to share stuff and work together with people and, and not earn money with the licenses, but with, yeah, working together with people. So I think that yep. was for me personally, how I started to do mm -hmm. the open source thing and started sharing things that I created, started working on our continuous integration tools, which also leverage open source tools like all the years, fantastic anti talk toolkit. And this is how I came to the whole thing. So I'm late to the party, I think. But at the same time, um, uh, besides um, obvious offerings like um, OpenG and uh, uh, the occasional VI package, I think only recently in the, in the last few years, maybe two years, three years, those things really picked up. That's my, pers that's my perception at least. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think you set up you, you you made a good setup for the next question question which is sometimes i hear from people uh that there's a fear about sharing your code first because you personally created it so it's kind of your baby <laughs> and also there's the mentality that well eventually i'm gonna make money out of this maybe so i don't want to share it with everybody so maybe i'll start with you <laughs> your, um, because how how do you get past that mentality and and why is it good to actually open source your tools well, I think one, one thing is if you're personally not averse to criticism, if you like to grow, um, I mean, that's easy to say if you're an outgoing personality, right. um, but of course it is. Uh, I mean, I remember when Richard Thomas presented at one of the CLA summits, his Swish toolkit, hmm. and he stood there in front of, I think it was the first CLA code review in Rome, maybe. And he yes. stood there in front of like 100 people who are the cleverest of the cleverest and, and like, 
stripped down bare naked and said, okay, this is it now. Uh, let me get your opinions. And this is when I realized this is not bad. This is free consulting from hundreds yeah. of the <laughs> cleverest people in the world. So what could they be better than get those opinions? Because yeah. they were not mean. Of right. course, they would point out things that you don't like to hear, but at the same time, there was so much knowledge. And I uh, thought, this, this cannot be bad. So why not put myself out there because I'm doing it the best I can. And if somebody comes around the corner with a better idea, <laughs> I mean, what, what, what better could there be in that situation? So I think uh, it's not, if you share something, some people are allowed to not like it, but so what? It doesn't matter at all. Other people may like it. Other people may even contribute. You might find new friends. You might make new enemies. So, I, don't, so <laughs> I think, I, I, honestly, I think that is a good thing to share stuff and get in touch with people because, um, Another saying from, from Austria is when people talk, they get together. Mm. So, and there's nothing better than that. And as for monetization, that's very difficult, of course. Um, and some things are easy to sell for money, uh, but many things are not because there is so much out there that people can get for free or it's not so hard to create it for themselves. So you just have to find your niche or your market, I think. And I mean, that's, that has nothing to do with open source in my opinion that's the same with closed source and with with every business mm. you need to find your market your niche your customers and try to do right. good work thanks yeah. for that and i think you put you point out something something really important about being just open to people looking at your code which the minute you said it i had like uh this like adverse reaction to it because it's scary right my yeah. wires are not aligned i don't have enough comments right etc okay good point um chris do you want to give us your thoughts yeah uh, so why, why open source? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could be giving away your IP and who wants to do that when you could charge for it, right? Right. Is that fair? Okay, so I'm gonna, one word, trust. So if I give you my code, uh, you, can, you can see what it is that I can do. You can learn from it. I can learn from you. And all of this builds trust so that uh, you can evaluate me and then potentially employ me or employ my future services. Mm. But what I've delivered to you up front is valuable. You can use this thing and it's a reflection of me and I get to help you. There's a whole entire other side benefit for getting to the privilege of helping other people. That's a privilege. And I really enjoy that. I think there's a lot of reward in it, but as you also get to share a little bit about who you are. Now, how do you monetize this? What I would suggest is you give a functioning piece of code that is extensible so you can customize it for somebody and then maybe you charge for that. But you're saying, hey, this thing already works out of the box. If you want me to drive it further, I most certainly can. I'd be happy to help you out that way. Yep. So I think the open sourceness comes in from establishing trust, demonstrating capability, giving value right out of the box and providing an, a business opportunity for extension. And I think you make a great point. Just if you're looking at sharing your code, a selfish point of view, it may be a good hiring practice if you want to get hired, right? At a different, sure. that's a way for people to see what you can do. So that's a great point. Um, yeah, Olivier, I'm curious about your thoughts. Uh, I think that there's um, many reasons to do open source, but uh, I'm not really afraid about sharing my code because I, I, I'm. I think that. Uh, in uh, the LabVIEW community, there's not that much people looking at the code you can share as an open source project. I don't know for your project, but for me, I have, I think four, five yeah. people looking at the code. And mm -hmm. these people, I, I'm already knowing them. Uh, they are sharing with me uh, through the GitLab project. So it's not a real, issue i think and uh, as as you said uh, all uh, this is not uh, something really uh, uh, smart this is just uh, uh, putting some i think i i hope good idea uh, into some project uh, so i'm not that afraid about uh, sharing my code and uh, speaking of uh, doing money with uh, open source projects for so far, I'm I'm just uh, seeing the uh, a way uh, to uh, 
communicate about uh, what uh, uh, I'm able to do uh, and Wovalab is able to do. So that's more something related to communication, I think. And it's right. personally, uh, it's really, uh, Yes, uh, like uh, Chris said, uh, it's really something for, for your ego. It's really when someone told me that uh, Antidoc is great, is a great tool. Uh, uh, yeah, that's worth it. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Just just the feeling of somebody is finding useful, right? I think that may yeah. be enough. Great point. So uh, the same question for you, Jim. But uh, so, of course, so I know JKI, of course, and so I'm just curious of your thoughts, especially because JKI has put out several tools and toolkits for the past several years, and they are free. People can use them. Mm -hmm. So how how do you how do you reconcile that with running a consulting business uh, actually make money, pay employees? So I'm curious of your thoughts and and how do you put those together? Yeah. So. <laughs> That's a good question. So kind of the business side of it. Um, so I'm just going to say some bad news is there's probably not a ton of money in selling uh, selling software widgets to developers. Um, it's been known for a long time. Uh, in general, uh, people are willing to pay for solutions to their problems their business problems, meaning mm -hmm. like I need to get this system running tomorrow <laughs> so that it can crank out tests or widgets or something like that. And they're less inclined to spend money on, on a reader for a file format or something like right. that, the developer, right? So however, you know, if you have a great file reader or some utility or you know a, a software application framework or something like that that's really good and helps the developer, you get it, that out there, and then people will use that on their projects, and it they'll see that like okay, this is this is a great way to do things, and then at some point you know they either you know need help using your tool or your framework on their project or they just get to know you because you're out there providing you know good answers and insights and tools so you earn some credibility um, and then you know they may call you or your company to say hey <laughs> we're behind we're behind the eight ball in this business opportunity uh, to get our system fully built and we need X, Y, and Z added to your tool to make it work for our system so maybe they pay for some customization or they just need you know more hired guns to get the thing built. Um, and then that can drive just a lot of um, business value. And because you, you've demonstrated your capabilities in the community uh, with the open source stuff, presumably you know you can command uh, you know a, a very you know reasonable, rate for your services or your solutions. And then I'd say the second thing too is if 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 you have components that are that are great and help you build systems faster. And your Jorg and I were having a conversation about this the other day on just you know tools that we share similar interests on um, mm -hmm. is like okay I'm not sure that we can make money like selling a tool like this, and this is a tool you know that was just out there we were talking about. But if if we can, because we know how to use it and embed it into a larger system and solution for our customers, if Jurg and I can work together to fix a few bugs or add a few features, and then Jurg's company and my company can build a system twice as fast, you know, some customers want to pay a fixed amount of money. For their solution to be, for their system to be solved, their problem to be solved, and so all of us who are using these tools can, you know, make. We're working together to make sure these tools are highly reliable and flexible and stuff, right. and then we can do that work faster and better and make more money, kind of helping each other that way. That's a that's a good point. That's a good point, and I think so. The the the, also, the, the point I want to uh, reemphasize that you made is. I mean, for a business, it, it is good marketing, right? It can be just self selfish good marketing, but also if you want to help people, and as you were saying, Jim, I mean, just yeah. putting out useful tools that are just make uh, are gonna make people's lives easier, right? And I think one thing that we see at JKI a lot is 
we get a lot of spaghetti code, right? Companies that come to us and just say, can you code? And it's just a mess. So we would rather have people start using, say, the JKI State Machine from the get-go. It's free. And then we actually get and, and we know how it works. It's easier to debug. It's easier to add stuff. Um, so I think that's a good perspective. Um, one, somebody from the audience was asking about InfoLabU. Anyone, anybody wants to comment on that? That was the first community that I got involved with back in 1995. And actually, <laughs> yeah, it was emails to folks in that community uh, that we kind of started some talks about, you know, OpenG and working together on libraries. And yeah, this is before you could share files in forums. <laughs> yeah. Were you mailing floppy disks or not? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that David Moore had even started a web page of all known VIs out on the internet. I could, uh, I could be wrong, but I, I, I want to say I've heard him say that before. Yeah. Can I, back when that was the thing. Harry, can I add one more yeah, go, go. Um, reason for open sourcing or for using mm -hmm. open source for your business is that your customer does not feel like you're locking him in, uh, depending mm -hmm. on you, your solution. Because, I mean, for us, it's DQMH. That's what we like to use. And we can tell our customers that uh, we can start this thing. You get everything. You get all the source code. And there's a bunch of people in the world who can pick up work if you, I don't know, if I win the lottery and retreat to my island, um, I can point to people who can pick up the work. Right. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, or, this is a, a huge, a huge. This is one of the big, uh, I think, um, selling propositions actually mm -hmm. to make the customer feel that he has that freedom of choice. He doesn't need to um, to play that card, but at least he knows he can if, if push comes to shove. And I think that's a yeah, good that's, thing that's too. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Um, the next question I, I wanted to ask was about um, what is what do you think is the impact of LabU Community Edition uh, for open source? And um, I'll I'll start with with Olivier, and then I'll randomly pick somebody else. But <laughs> I'm curious about your thoughts. Probably I'm not the the right person to to reply this question because uh, I'm I'm not uh, using the this. But uh, if I uh, remember when I first uh, hear about the LabVIEW community, uh, I can see that this I can say that this is something that was really uh, expecting by a lot of people uh, being able to. Uh, write uh, lab you could uh, even if you are not in your company uh, mm -hmm. and so I think uh, I think it's a really uh, good thing uh, for for the lab you community but I I don't have any uh, uh, figures to to tell uh, but uh, definitely it's a, a really good uh, thing for us all right no, all, all lab you developers because I, I think all of us, uh, we are really in love with LabVIEW. So the more people are using LabVIEW, uh, the, the, the better it is. I agree. I totally agree. Chris, Chris, what are your thoughts on that? And also, I'm also interested because, because of your NI background. Sure. Uh, so I think that uh, like so many major events in history, it's, it's rarely one uh, element that makes that overall event happen. So what I mean is I think LabVIEW Community Edition is one of the pillars, one of the fundamental elements that must be in place in order to see uh, a growth and expansion, not only in LabVIEW usage, but also in growing our, our tool set, which is all the open source code. So uh, with the advent of LabVIEW Community, now people can evaluate and actually taste and see how, how cool LabVIEW is, and maybe they'll want to actually try it. Well, the reason why I say that's just one of maybe two or three elements that needs to be in place is Somebody who uh, might want to try a language, they don't just want to see, ooh, how do I spell in this language, but rather what kind of poetry can I write? And this is clearly an analogy. Well, you go to other languages like Python, where you can try it for free, uh, then they might say, ooh, can I, I don't know, do stuff with Excel? And then they go to this one site and they say, what sort of modules are available for me to mess with Excel so I can get what I care about done? 
So that's the second major element. I think that there has to be a growing and accessible set of modules and toolkits that people can use to actually accomplish what they want. So the language has to be easily accessible and there has to be a growing code base that enables the people evaluating the language to do what it is that they want. So I'm super excited. If either of those two things happened in isolation of the other, I don't think that we would see near the response, near the growth or the potential growth in the community. Hmm. But now with both of these things together, growing code base that's accessible and a language that's free for evaluation, I think that we're at an inflection point. So that's me pulling up my crystal ball and being really excited about this. Great. Thanks for your opinion. So do we have a follow-up question and then I'll move to, to, to Jim. But so do you think we'll get so the people that were previously programming for Arduino, programming for Raspberry Pi, using the, the, the Arduino language that is kind of C. So are we gonna get those people to actually start using LabVIEW, do you think? Is that- That's a great question. Uh, my, so again, it's me pulling up my crystal ball. Right, right, right. Uh, this is pure conjecture. Uh, <laughs> my, my hope is, uh, clearly my hope is yes. I think that we stand a better chance today of capturing that audience better than we ever have before. Um, I think that it's going to take us in this panel, everybody who's attending now, and the leaders of the community to help onboard those potential LabVIEW community members. And so this is kind of an all hands on deck. This is a call out to everybody in the LabVIEW community to help onboard and show how cool this tool is that we get the chance to use. Right. That's a, that's a good point. That's a great point. And the, the same question for you, Jim, and... I also want to tie it to, so JKI released the APM Community Edition right after LabVIEW Community Edition. So what are your thoughts on the impact of LabVIEW being more open now? And then why why, why the decision of also having a VIPM Community Edition? Yeah, sure. I, <laughs> I could talk about this one for all, all okay, day. I'll, 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 I'll time you, I'll time you. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I agree with what, you know, uh, Chris is saying the, the 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 accessibility of LabVIEW via you know community edition having the ability to download and try it out and write some code for free for you know simple hello world or even you know commercial uh, personal hobby projects is is really critical and I think especially for getting um, new and and young people interested in LabVIEW who are familiar with the ability to do this and things like Python and other stuff. Um, and, you know, just who <laughs> can't afford to spend a thousand dollars or something like that on a LabVIEW license. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, I think, you know, uh, as, as I mentioned, I've, I've been involved in open source for a really long time and enjoy participating in the community, building and sharing tools, you know, and um, VIPM, you know, we worked hard to try to, you know, have a free version and a paid version and try to have a, kind of a combo product. Um, once National Instruments released the community edition of LabVIEW freely available for non-commercial use, um, you know, we just see the community, you know, growing incredibly as a result of that. And the VIPM tool is incredibly, you know, useful for doing the uh, sharing of libraries and installing them into LabVIEW. And so we wanted to make sure that, you know, that was also available to that community so that they could have the ability to, you know, find and download and get these set up into their development environment and, you know, participate in open source projects so that these open source projects can freely use um, VI Package Manager for installing these things. So, uh, and uh, can I ask uh, just a follow up to that? So, who's who's your who, who do you think is the target for VIP game community and at the same time LabVIEW community? Uh, sure. Um, so, I don't know who NI is trying to target. Um, who, who I think uses it and I'm excited about, I think, is uh, individuals who may work as scientists or engineers professionally. Um, and then they also want to participate in open source stuff at home or their hobby projects at home. So individuals who maybe, you know, want to take that skill set with them regardless of where they work. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also think too, like just even like young people, students, hobbyists, people who, you know, they get an Arduino or a Beetlebone 
uh, bored and they want to like write some code and they see that, oh, there's this cool visual programming thing, like let's give that a try. Um, and so I think that that's, that's a really, um, a really big target group as well. Um, so I, I think it's basically kind of those, those two, you know, kind of engineers at home working right. on the open source stuff and then kind of students and young people, hobbyists that, that aren't really in the engineering world, but they're mostly kind of in the maker world. Right. And that's a great point because I mean, I feel it for myself, like I want to automate my blinds. I want to be able to talk to my Roomba from yeah. lab here, right? So uh, I think that's a great point. So I mean, I, I personally feel like I would be a target for both LabVIEW and the APM community. Um, Jorg, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on, on LabVIEW community. What's the impact overall and for you, if you have any examples? So frankly, I feel like I gotta be the devil's advocate here because I think that we're in a big echo chamber. As much as mm -hmm. I do love the LabVIEW community, um, I can see that, uh, that I get excited about VM and its community edition and uh, what I can find on VIPM.io recently. Um, I'm not so sure that LabVIEW is, only because it's free now, it is as sexy as other options are out there, mm -hmm. for, especially for the makers, for the young um, people who, who like like to play around, maybe even do it in the browsers, because you still, you need to download LabVIEW, it's still, I don't know, a gigabyte or whatever, you need to install it. Um, and um, I'm not saying that this is bad per se, or that it can be easily changed, but it's still a fact, that it's still, um, there's still a huge threshold compared to other software products that are out there. Um, I don't know, looking at Arduino, for example, I think it's a fraction of the time you need to connect to your Arduino compared to installing LabVIEW and getting that up and running. Mm -hmm. So I'm, um, I think a little bit like Chris said, um, it is one of the things that were very important to happen because it enables many people to pick up what all from work or from, from univers university and, and continue that work at home. And that I think that goes around and comes back to, I don't know, bringing up LabVIEW in their work later on because they already know the tool. So I do think that it's great. And um, actually I was honored to write the blog post about it on the NI blog. Um, at the time, I liked that a lot. And it was very great when we, when we heard that message from Eric at the uh, GDEF club. But I think where could, the, the next thing that NI maybe could look into is to, to spice up the community web presence, if, if that's a thing, mm -hmm. to make it more attractive easier to find stuff, uh, the things that you said before, all of you guys. Um, I feel like that we're, that there's an effort and that we're going in the right direction, but we're not there yet. So and that's, that's my follow, personal yeah, follow perception. And I think it's great, it's, 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 it's good to have that, that view. So as a follow-up to you, Jörg, so do you think what, what you mentioned is something that LabVIEW itself has to change or has to evolve? Or can the community build tools and templates and whatever around it to make LabVIEW better and easier easier for people to adopt? I think both things, um, because there, the truth is in the middle somewhere. So if you can lower the, the threshold on both sides, it will be easier. So maybe there's a way, I don't know, to make it easier to, to get into LabVIEW, to use LabVIEW. At the same time, have a more appealing <laughs> entry point for people new to the whole thing. Because uh, as you said, it's easy to get us all riled up about talking to the Roomba via LabVIEW or <laughs> controlling the, the blinds from LabVIEW where there's no use at all for that, if you're honest. Mm -hmm. Nearly no use for that because you can do it e more easily with nicer uh, mobile phone apps and whatnot, but still doing it via LabVIEW, it even warrants having a server running in your home office or whatever. Yeah. So we do those <laughs> kinds of things, obviously. <laughs> and we like that. And uh, we have MQTT um, broadcasting our CO2 values to some whatever, which doesn't make a difference to the world, but still we enjoy doing that. Right. Uh, so it's not hard to get us enthused, and I am. Um, so it's harder to get new people into the ecosystem. And uh, that will be a challenge, I think. Right. That's a good point. And um, maybe to add to that, so. For sure, we see it um, that on VIPM, there's a lot of interest for Arduino and Raspberry Pi. And 
I, I think there's there, there there's something there, and definitely what what if, what Jim mentioned, since since Labio community was released, definitely we've seen more interest in people that maybe otherwise wouldn't wouldn't have considered Labio. So my hope, I kind of agreeing with you, Jorg, that as we move forward and as we start building more tools and as Labio itself evolves, then we can we can get a bigger chunk of that of, mm -hmm. of that market and, and just people. Um, somebody was asking about the possibility of making Labio itself open source. Who, who want, is, is that, I mean, is that possible? I have, I have, I, have go, go to. It's, I don't have the answer to that. Um, so I, I think the kind of the direction I see things heading with like Labview next generation NXG is that, you know, there's going to be more and more effort spent on the ability to compile and run LabVIEW code on kind of, let's say, kind of more, I don't, I'm hesitant to not use the term industry standard, but let's say more web standard technologies, like um, in JavaScript, for example, like, you know, the, the web VIs compile into JavaScript uh, code, byte code that can run in a runtime engine that's implemented in JavaScript. And this is for, Right now, it's for running browser-based code in the browser, right? The the GUIs. So you have code, the back end of the GUIs running in the browser. However, that same you know code could compile and run you know anywhere. You can run a JavaScript engine, including on a server or on a desktop and stuff like that. And so I, I would I would see it being very natural that LabVIEW would use would continue to move towards using more web standard technologies like HTML and JavaScript and, and stuff like that. And I think probably naturally, you know, there's going to be more and more kind of interest in having, you know, open source stuff under the hood of LabVIEW and NI, you know, you know, and I think NI does in source uh, in, you know, light uh, open source technologies under the hood with the what, low level virtual machine and some other stuff. I think their JavaScript runtime uh, I forget the name of it, but I think that that was open sourced uh, as well. Um, I think one one thing that's really hard is how do you have, you know, an open source IDE, mm -hmm. right? Like right. how do you what? And maybe maybe this is something the community could be working on is like an open standard text based format or just any open source format for. For, for lab code for graphical programs. Right. Um, of course, humans aren't necessarily going to be able to read anything beyond a simple hello world, right? Like single node, hello world to dialogue, you can like curly brace that pretty easily, right? But when you start talking about, you know, parallel code and wires between them, you know, we can't really scroll and see those connections with our eyes. So we do need high level tools that can essentially draw those lines and allow us to interact and move. You can't do that in the text editor. Yeah. Um, and I so, agree. and so yeah. I think it's, you know, how do you create a business model <laughs> developing an open source, let's say IDE. Um, right. And I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Chris, do you want to go? Yeah. So I'm going to use some, I believe statements, Jim, to kind of build on what you were just saying. Okay. Uh, so I believe, that NI wants to do and capitalize on the things that NI can do the best. I believe that NI wants to see growth in the number of people using their tools. Mm -hmm. So I believe that NI is interested in engaging with the community and open sourcing those areas that they can, uh, and then capitalizing in the areas that NI can like really focus and make a huge difference in. So now let me resolve all of that to some concrete things. Uh, I believe that there are things that only NI can do. Uh, so when you take a look at stuff under the hood or there's some proprietary you know, bits and stuff, only NI can fix that stuff, but there's a shield around that, that nugget that's right now captured by NI that could be opened up for everybody else to you know, start, start to mess around. Here's some examples. And this is, this is really, really straightforward stuff. Let's imagine that all APIs in VI Lib moved to object-oriented programming so that we could extend them. No, that's not open source, but that's more open so that we can at least start building on top of what they already have. Uh, I think that NI is incentivized, is interested in figuring out how they can 
unlock as much as possible to bring the community to bear and grow the tool set. And then NI capitalizes on only what NI can do. Hmm. That's a good point. That's a great point. Um, Olivier, your, do you want to, do you guys want to add anything? I, I cannot. So the, speaking of uh, making LabVIEW uh, an open source uh, application, for me as a LabVIEW developer, I think I, I'm not really interested in, because I'm, I'm just knowing how to work with LabVIEW. I'm a LabVIEW mm -hmm. developer. I'm not a, a computer science uh, right. guru. So I, I want to have the, uh, the most access possible on the LabVIEW code in LabVIEW. And uh, perhaps the thing that uh, I missed with uh, NXJ is that uh, everything is is made with C sharp, or we we don't have the access we have uh, currently with uh, LabVIEW uh, with LabVIEW. So for me, it's not uh, something I I really uh, want to have uh, LabVIEW uh, open source. And that's a, that's a good point because I think it goes to what together with what Chris was saying that maybe it's not everybody having access to the C or or whatever yep. code that runs behind, but being able to extend what is available, yes. um, extend or, or see how it works when it's made with in uh, G programming. Right. I think right. because I, I I don't understand other languages. Right, <laughs> myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Jorg, do you want to add anything? I think um, saying that LabVIEW should be open source um, can mean a number of things, like open source because then it's free. And if that is the meaning, is it free as in beer or free as in speech? Why should it be that? Is there actually a lot of, are there actually lots of people who want to extend the ID or change it even? Because like we said, extending might be possible. Um, and is, that, is the community big enough that there is like a critical mass for that to even make sense. Because if That's there are three question. people have the time and knowledge to do that, I would say that nothing will come from it. So I think uh, this would be an interesting discussion to have, um, but maybe the effort would be better put into making it more extensible in some places that we could benefit from. Like, I don't know. I, I personally, I would like to have the INL as a run all the time in the background. So that I get not the broken oh. arrow, but I get the red arrow when something of some, one of my tests is like not uh, passing. I would probably put some work into that if, if, if there mm. was a way to do that. And if it was like really in the background, so that it doesn't annoy me, but that would be awesome because then- That's fascinating. I would not have to create like a pre-commit hook or something, which we don't do, which we don't do, but which I, we played around with, which is technically possible. But if you hit the commit button and then everything stalls for like 90 seconds because that's the time it takes to run, that's not really a nice thing. So these things, I think they would be interesting, but I'm not sure if there is enough manpower to look into these things. That would be interesting. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And, and maybe it goes back to what we were saying that right now the hope is for the amount of LabVIEW developers around the, the globe to just start growing. And eventually we'll get to that critical mass where open source projects just become a, a big thing in LabVIEW. Um, one thing somebody reminded me of was, uh, because Chris, you were saying about extending existing LabVIEW code. I wanted to ask mm -hmm. anybody, but I know Jim knows about this, uh, about the, what was the, what was the slogan um, about scripting? Legalize scripting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've not heard that before. That's pretty funny. Yeah, so we had some uh, private discussions with NI over the years. Um, <laughs> Legalize. And, uh, and yeah. what year was that? John, just curious of, of the like the anything yeah, was, that you can share. It's seventies. No, uh, so, <laughs> so basically, so scripting scripting was was not a, a feature of LabVIEW. So what scripting is is using writing LabVIEW code that interacts with LabVIEW code at edit time. So writing a code that says open a reference to a block diagram, um, you know, create a while loop you know, add a node to the while loop and you have references to these things on the block diagram, just like you have control references. Right. So that was 
something that was a private feature only accessible to people at NI. And then, you know, you can't keep anything a secret on the internet for too long. So, you know, as the discussion forums evolved, people started to like see hints of these things hiding under rocks. And um, so there's a principle some smart computer scientist wrote at some point that says something like, uh, you know, in order to do software engineering, you need machine readable and writable source code. It's a prerequisite for doing software engineering. And so, you know, we we pleaded with NI saying like, you know, our, our problems that we're having as LabVIEW developers are because we, we can't really do software engineering. And so, you know, we absolutely need scripting. Um, and so, yeah, we created this little Volkswagen van image where it said legal scripting on the side of the <laughs> you know, uh, free love hippies riding on the side. Did um, you ever make any shirts? Any t shirts? Oh my gosh. You should awesome. totally make some shirts about that. You tell them. I can yes. I, it's somewhere. But what I was, <laughs> um, some of us, you know, had some access to it. And, you know, the question was, you know, what would you guys do with it? And, you know, we, you know, just built a little kind of plug-in framework for creating our own like IDE tools in LabVIEW that like created like crazy menus and and productivity boosts. And then so and I then opened up scripting right. and said, Oh, that sounds really useful. Let's actually productize this as a feature. And the the reason I wanted to ask that is because it Basically, what we're saying is maybe having LabVIEW be open source just means exposing some features so that they can be extended by us, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. it's kind of related to scripting. Uh, personally, I believe that LabVIEW scripting should be in Python, but that's that's just me. Um, <laughs> Bite your tongue. Bite your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we only have five or six minutes. So I, I like I, I like to hear from all of you. Um, if people are interested in learning more or getting into creating an open source project or collaborating in one, mm. uh, how would you recommend they do that? And I'll start with uh, maybe your. Yeah, um, I think there are some great references out there in the web. Um, I think especially for, for LabVIEW, uh, you could look at the uh, presentation that James and I gave. We have uh, a slide with some links. Uh, there are some, some portals, there are the open source guides open source dot guide is the, the web page where you can read up on all things or many things about how to do that, how to maintain a project, what is important. And the three things that are important are communication, communication, and communication. Hmm. So what? that's basically yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, just put yourself out there probably. I think, um, don't expect too much maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because it's a it's a dire business, as as we all alluded, uh, as you all said. Um, but share something and see if anybody's interested in it. Just do it. That's a good point, um, Chris. Do you want to? Yeah. So my my hope uh, in folks getting started with uh, open source initiatives is that they don't have to get started. I would love to see a, a couple of folks in our community, and I'm I'm actually working on this to give people a starting point inside of the various um, online source code control repositories. So can you imagine if there was an, a source code control repository that already had a LabVIEW project in it that was already organized to build an NI package, a VI package, and a G package? And then it already had wikis set up to organize their documentation so that they just instantiate, and then they just start filling in blanks. I think one of the biggest challenges to people starting with open source is it's a completely open book and then you get blank mm -hmm. BI syndrome. So I'm not suggesting that there is the right way to do open source, but if you're just starting, you don't know what you don't know. So I wonder if we uh, and the, le the leaders of the community can at least suggest, here's some, some areas to fill in that you didn't even know that you didn't know. Mm. And one of the things I'm hoping to do in the near future is at least in Bitbucket and I'll move it over to Gitbucket and then GitLab, whatever is to say, here's a repository that's already organized, set up to build, set up to document, just put all your source code here. And this is how you help other people can collaborate with you. Yeah, that's interesting. So kind of like a, a how to, that just makes it so that I don't have to think too much, right? Somebody just, exactly. just follow a, a few a few steps and then I'm, I'm good. Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah, could yeah, you I'd imagine? Like 
I hate to call this an ex express block of the Git repository, but imagine the express block of the Git repository <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. So we're running a documentation platform, a Doku Wiki it's called, and I tried or we tried to put as much information as possible about our way of working, about the processes, about Git flow, the forking workflow, uh, all these things, the project <coughs> uh, structure, the repository structure, the lab use structure, our style guides, our way of working, whatever. So it's all there. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody reads it, but me. But if anybody was interested, it would be there. If you have yeah, a put link. A link. Put a link yes. in the chat because I think right. at least 73 people are looking at us. 74. <laughs> well, I will, well, 74 now. <laughs> I will take um, the opportunity to, to share great. that, yes, of course. Um, Olivier, do you want to do you want to tell people like from your experience how they can get started? As I said before, I think you need to know how Git works to hmm. work on uh, GitLab, GitHub or uh, Bitbucket. So if you want to, to collaborate on a project, you, you need to understand the, the basic of, uh, of Git. Um, you should probably start your own project, but you can also find a project you like and try to collaborate. Just yep. try to clone the fork and clone the, the repository. Look at the the code and see if there is something to to make to help this project if you like it and this is a i i think a, a good way to to start working uh, with an open source project and you are learning uh, and and the community is really small so you can find help uh, if you reach out to your or chris or, or me or anyone most, uh, most yeah, uh, you you will have a, a reply and an assistance to great get you through the, uh, the process. That. And Jim, same question. We have one minute ready too. Uh, okay, yeah. So easy ways, uh, use stuff and report bugs and request features is probably the way to get started. <laughs> right. And then when the when the developers tell you, that's a great idea. Why don't you try to add that feature? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> exactly right. So um, one of the things we did uh, recently with you know, people can find stuff easily in VIPM. It searches, it searches the web, all the packages. You can download an array library. When you get to the package info dialog, there's a little kind of comment discuss button that will take you to a page where you can request a feature, report feedback, and that gets emailed directly to the developers who published the package. And then there's also a link there you know, if they have like a GitHub or a GitLab project or wherever, it, it links to that page so you can use their issue tracking system. So we've, you know, been working hard to, you know, get the, the, the hurdles out of the way for your typical engineer scientist who wants to use open source stuff to kind of be able to sort of get it installed in the pallets, but then also to provide some feedback and then kind of tiptoe their way into collaboration. Great, that's awesome. So I think we're out of time. So thank you everybody for for making the time to our panel and to everybody that joined. I think there's another area if people want to continue the conversation, I think they can go to a, a separate room to have like follow up conversations. Um, but feel free to send messages to to any of us if you have any any follow up questions. And um, personally, looking forward to to just making the LabVIEW ecosystem better and more accessible and, and easier to use. So um, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Javier, for hosting us. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.